Welcome to the latest episode of MQ's Open Mind. And this week, Craig and I are delighted to welcome a fantastic guest, another fantastic guest, Dr. Lucy Folks. And Lucy is a Prudence Trust Research Fellow in the Department of Experimental Psychology at the University of Oxford. So welcome to our podcast, Lucy. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Welcome in. We're really excited. To, I'm, I'm familiar with your work, both your popular science book, which came out in 2021, which we'll talk about shortly, but also the fantastic research you do as well. So what I'd be keen maybe to begin with is tell us a bit about your journey in, in sort of mental health research and more broadly, and we all have a different interest or in mental health. Do you want to tell us a bit about your story in terms of where your interest in mental health came from? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I was depending how far back you go. I was originally going to do medicine when I was doing my GCCs and um, took psychology on a bit of a whim as an AS level subject and then um, realised I liked it much better. Just found it fascinating. So I I switched and decided to apply for psychology at university instead. Uh, And then when I was at university, I just think the, the mental health side of it is fascinating I mean I think it's interesting understanding when psychology goes wrong or sort of stops serving us so I, I think that you know it's not a particularly un- original thing of an undergraduate but I was always very interested in the clinical mm-hmm. side of it um, and I had some experience of my own problems around that time but I don't I don't think that really made me interested in this I think I was interested in this already I just think it's fascinating yeah no it is like and and what's really interesting I think is how our attitudes towards mental health and mental illness have changed over the years I know you talk a lot about this uh, in your book what mental illness really is and what it isn't and I know obviously at the start of the book you talk about your own experiences which you 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 alluded to and I think it's a powerful personal narrative but also powerful and I think in, in illustrating the way we talk about mental health more broadly. So do you want to tell us a bit about well, how you started the book and, and that the experience of, of mental health problems yourself? It's funny, and I, I debated whether to put it in the book or not, but really I wanted to include it in the book because I wanted the reader to know that I wasn't just coming at this purely from an academic perspective. So even though I don't particularly find it easy to talk about, I felt like I sort of had a responsibility to the reader to tell them that I... You know, I'm interested in this academically, but I also really know how it feels um, when you're unwell and how bad that is. And I think that gives me a little bit more license to make some of the criticisms that I make about the way we talk about mental health. So that's why I included it. Um, But yeah, it just it made for a a good, (laughs) structurally a good opening in the book to say um, that I had my own experience of uh, depression towards the end of university and that it's sort of just so happened to coincide with the beginning of this transformation in the way we talk about mental health Mm -hmm. because when it happened to me which wasn't really all that long ago as in 2008 no one talked about it you know it was it was a sort of deep deep secret and you know I would see doctors and things and they'd say this is incredibly common and I would think it's it's not meaningful that you say that because everywhere I look no, no one else is appears to be having these problems and so just by coincidence that my own experience sort of happened at the what I see as a, a start of a, a shift and in the in the subsequent years there was suddenly this sort of explosion in uh, people talking about mental health in a different way. No I agree with that in, in terms of timeline because as somebody who's worked in this area for quite a while from the mid 90s well through to now obviously and continuing but I think probably my sense as well I don't know if 2008's I don't know if it's precise to them, but certainly in the first 10 years, I would say of working in this area, and a lot of the work I do is obviously the most extreme end of devastation from mental health or, or social crisis or social problems. Um, but definitely there is something happened to that. And I don't know if it's a post-millennium thing. I don't know what it was or where some important um, people in the public eye starting to talk about it more or whatever. It's hard. It is really hard. But but actually, can I maybe sort of slightly sidetrack then actually on that? Because you published a recent paper and like new ideas in, in psychology. And I suppose it relates a bit to this explosion idea of talking about it. And maybe there's some of the, what is the, the potential impacts about is it is it really that there's been an increase in mental health problems? I know this is at the crux of a lot of your thinking, mm-hmm. or is it is it that there has been an increase, or that we're talking about it? It's normalised. So maybe Joy, t- tell us. But I know you've written so eloquently about this, but also I'd really like to 
the, the recent paper you, you've, ta you've talked about, it's in a more empirical way, I would say. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting to say about uh, writing about it eloquently, because obviously it, it isn't the my writing and talking about it is that end point of a lot of thinking about it where it's very messy to try and unpack it all. But yeah, that that paper that you mentioned where we talk about the prevalence inflation hypothesis was, you know, I'd been I'd written about it in the book and I talked about it an awful lot in interviews. And then I really wanted and written about it in, you know, newspapers and magazines. And I really wanted to formalize it in an academic publication. So that was that paper that you're talking about where I write that, there, yeah, there's no one explanation. There will never be one explanation for why uh, more people are reporting mental health problems now. Um, but I'm, uh, well, along with my colleague, Jack Andrews, we're presenting the possibility that actually the way we're talking about it is one factor that's contributing to the increase in problems that uh, we're seeing. And we talk about that as sort of two possible mechanisms. So one of them, a good thing, and one of them, not so good. So the, the first one is that it's really quite obvious, but it's if you encourage people to talk more about mental health and you run lots of campaigns and you destigmatize mental health problems, then of course, some people who might previously not have reported their mental health problems are now coming forward, they're going to the GP, uh, they're, you know, ticking the elevated box on questionnaires, for example. So actually, the, the sort of underlying rate hasn't increased, you know, these people were depressed or anxious or whatever before. It's just that they now feel able to report that that's what they're feeling. So the, the net result is still that it will look like things are getting worse, but they haven't necessarily. And actually, that that mechanism is a good thing. Like that was the whole point of telling people to talk more about this stuff. But then the, the sort of second route, which I'm particularly interested in, is the possibility that this well-intended plan to talk more about it is actually sort of backfired in that it's encouraged people to conceptualise milder sort of co more common everyday negative sometimes you know extremely negative experiences um as being mental health problems and then reporting them as such and you know telling their gp about it which is in itself could um sort of misrepresent how many people have mental health problems but then i, I think it could actually even itself lead to an increase if if it um leads to these problems in a kind of self-fulfilling manner so I'm very interested in the possibility that if you frame your, your problem your anxiety is an anxiety problem or an anxiety disorder could you actually bring that anxiety into being or increase it so there's those two routes one of them's a good thing one of them is more problematic and I, I really want to probably spend a lot of my career trying to unpack and sort of empirically investigate whether those things are happening. No that's uh, really fascinating Lucy and I mean, in particular, when I think about those two explanations or potential explanations, the second one is clearly will be bidirectional. Both of them are obviously in some ways bidirectional, but I think it's a challenge to see how you would unpack that in a, an empirical way. But, but I wonder, though, going back to the point about so my, my sense is, I think that definitely there's, a, I and again, it's intuitive, but it's not scientific in that way. I, I, I agree that I think that a lot, certainly a certain percentage of the increased reporting is linked to in some ways increased awareness but i also get a sense for, for example in the work that we do in sort of suicide and self-harm is that there is there has been if you triangulate all the different data sources with all its implicit biases i do think that suicidal behavior not suicide globally i'm talking for example in the uk or the united states context that they have increased those rates have increased in recent years and I don't think that's to do simply with a, an awareness thing. So I wonder, have you any sense in that? What's your thinking on that, that in terms of other increase or the sort of extent to which the phenomena have increased rather than just the reporting of them? I mean, this is the thing that I just I don't know. And I don't know how we could ever actually figure out what the relative contribution of different factors are. Um, but I totally agree that I, I don't think it's just the way we're talking about it or, or that, you know, it'd be reasonable that there would be lots of other possibilities. I think especially um, talking about s suicidal behaviour, you know, I think it's, it seems particularly hard to make the argument that that's just about more reporting, you know. Um, so I think there's lots of things, lots of potential explanations. I mean, people love to talk about social media as a possible um, explanation. Uh, I don't think social media is irrelevant. You know, I don't think we really know what its role is exactly, but I think there's lots of plausible reasons why that might have increased people's distress. 
uh, there's some interesting arguments about educational stress mm-hmm. changing that that for well I'm, I'm particularly interested in teenagers um that you know the stakes are genuinely higher in education now they're genuinely under more pressure than they were sort of than teenagers were 10 or 20 years ago and that that could play a role I mean, people like to talk about the pandemic as well, but obviously people were talking about there being a mental health crisis before the pandemic existed. So I think that can't, well, certainly not the whole story, but yeah, t- totally there's there's so many different factors and I don't think we can really fully ever tease apart yet yeah, what portion of it is, is attributed to what cause. Yeah, no, and, and obviously thinking about social media, the pandemic and educational pressures, I think the... Well, the social media, I, I would certainly not dispute the fact for somebody who's re- already vulnerable, mm. the consequences can be devastating. But if we look at the work, the research out there, the size of the statistical effect on a population level is is modest. And, and of course, it's one of many, many factors in this sort of perfect storm of factors. But I think what we'll maybe returning to, or maybe say a bit about your book specifically, which I'll, for those of you who are watching this on, on YouTube, it is a fantastic read, and I'm not even just saying that. It's a brilliant <laughs> book, and and actually, it's um, it sparked a lot of conversations. I think that I've seen on social media, and um, actually, Charlie Cox, who's one of our ambassadors for MQ, the poets. I don't know if you know Charlie. Do you know Charlie? No. So Charlie was when I was on her flicking through Instagram. I think was it last week. This is the book she's reading now. Very cool. This Great. Is the book, and she was saying, "Oh, it's her copy is covered with notes throughout because it's made really made her think." And, and Charlie talks openly about her own experience of of mental health. So maybe can Lucy? I know the book came out in twenty twenty one, but can you maybe tell us for those of who haven't read it yet or got it, what did you hope to do with the book? Um, because the title, obviously, for some people, is quite controversial. <laughs> um, so do you want to maybe tell us a bit about that, and then we'll weave that back into I know you're particularly interested in, in young people's mental health. It's funny because what has what the book has become known for, and I guess the title has contributed to this, and what people always ask me questions about is this as this aspect about uh, you know over medicalizing and the change in language around mental health, um, and that was sort of the drive of the book. But the, the purpose of the book really was about providing some clarification about what we know from the science and the research about what you know mental health problems are I felt my sort of desire to write the book came from seeing all these campaigns all this awareness efforts this increased conversation about mental health but I felt like there's a lot of stuff I was reading in the mass media and social media I was thinking I'm not sure that's true and I'm also not sure if it's helpful like, I'm not sure if I were someone who's having um, problems right now that that information or that campaign or that tweet would be useful so I, I really wanted to try and say there's so much information out there at the moment but actually I think a lot of people are more confused than ever so I I wanted to try and write a a sort of succinct map about what we what we know so far about what mental health problems are what causes them uh what we might try and do to treat them um so it, it was it was a sort of broad overview really but what people have been most interested in is what I yeah how I open the book and then what I come back to later in the book is to say that I think the way we're talking about it and the the malleability and messiness of mental health concepts has has meant we're having some yeah sort of collateral damage from the way we're talking about it and I and I I don't think it's wholly good the way we're talking about it that that's what I think the book has kind of become known for mm-hmm. and so what and so what, what sort of feedback there's the bits I've seen have been people saying it's really helped me understand how I feel and that, that the obviously idea of the continuum idea of, and how you diagnosis are used and constructed and helpful for some people not helpful helpful for others so tell, can you tell us a bit about the feedback you've, you've received then yeah I mean I was um nervous before the book came out that it would be criticized a lot more than it has been I mean certainly to my face people have been <laughs> very nice about it and I've had an awful lot of emails from uh, parents, teachers, psychiatrists, psychologists saying um, that they agree that, you know, something's going wrong with the way we're talking about mental health. Um, interestingly, often people say, you know, that they they agree, but in confidence or, you know, don't, you know, off the record. And I think that's in itself is very interesting. It's like people don't want to stand up and admit this. But the the loveliest emails I get are the people who email say, like I had a really simple one uh, a few weeks ago saying someone 
from someone that just said thank you you helped me better understand myself and that you know and I'm sure you'll know from your own book that really yeah that makes all the hard work worthwhile oh totally and that's I mean that's why it's so important books like that to get get to be, people who don't read your academic papers and I know it's I know you'll be surprised to hear this but <laughs> not everybody does not everybody does unfortunately oh I'm fully really aware of that yeah <laughs> But you make an interesting point there a second ago about the, the obviously we, all of us working in mental health know about the stigma of mental health, right? So then, but you've got this, me, what you've just described is sort of a meta stigma. It's obviously the stigma of people admitting that there might are to an alternative conceptualization of the sort of mental illness, mental health problems paradigm. And, and it's a fear and I get it. And I, um, <laughs> you know, careful when I, write and talk about these things people are worried that if you try saying people are over pathologizing or over medicalizing mental health you know not all teenagers are unwell etc that you're somehow dismissing the cases of distress that really are bad and I as I really tried to get across in the book it's like all across the spectrum it's all horrible you know you don't need to have you know a, a migraine for a headache to be banned for example same thing you know you don't need to be depressed for low mood to be really difficult and I you know part of getting our way out of this problem I think is to try and respect it across you know distress across the board but yeah I was sitting talking to someone the other day and they they said they wouldn't want to admit publicly that a lot of teenagers are fine and I thought you know that we've got a problem there if we if it's becoming socially unacceptable to promote the fact that some teenagers are not you know don't have mental health problems which is true I mean that's a that's a big problem if we don't want to say that anymore yeah no I think that both things can be true, right? So both statements are true is that there's real distress out there. And I, without doubt, do not, I totally believe that distress has increased in teenagers. And, and as you said already, Lucy, before the pandemic, and then it's continued to increase. In, and the most recent data for adolescents, children and adolescents, in terms of suicidal behavior, that's definitely increased. I don't dispute that for a second. But there's a there is a but the, the parallel can also be true, which is yeah, with, that there are definitely individuals out there who who probably are okay, and that we do, so we, it's, but it's been, been allowing you know, the nuance of both those messages to be conveyed. Exactly. And, and, and I must say, for me in your book, I I didn't take from it anything. I I didn't take that you were minimizing or I thought you were give a really balanced explanation of of how. You, there is a risk of over pathologizing, but there was real a sense of empathy and but grounded in, in evidence and science. And I think that's what's important is we need to be driven by the science mm. and what's the reality out there. Okay, yeah. so just just before we leave this book, so I'd really recommend anybody please um, buy Lucy's book, which is also available. I'm not getting any money for this. It's <laughs> also available, obviously, on I assume it's an it's an audible, I assume. It is. I read it out myself in the depths of lockdown, went into a this little booth in Toncourt Road and padded booth and read it out. Um, yeah, and which is hard work. I don't know if you do that for your own book. Um, it, yeah. yeah, it's absolutely exhausting. But yeah, it is It is available in audio. It's exhausting. And you, start, you, you, for, you forget what your own voice sounds like. It's just bizarre. I do the intros for the audio version of this podcast, and that's literally two minutes, and it's too much for me. <laughs> I can't even imagine doing a whole book. It, it's it's amazing. The, the level of concentration involved was just amazing. And um, yeah, the, the original edit is just must be full of, uh, swearing and corrections and because the second you mess up anything you have to go back to the beginning of the sentence again and yeah trying to pronounce people's names and yeah long numbers and stuff and it's just yeah it was intense concentration but I think quite a good lockdown activity yeah no because we'll move on but my so whatever my producer person he was just the most patient person in the world <laughs> and, uh, but but it's funny you just get in a rule with no errors at all but then you just get to a sentence and it's like, I just can't get that sentence out. I can't, or somebody's name. And I remember at times we would just pause and we were saying, how do you pronounce that person's name? And we would then <laughs> basically find it. Google it on YouTube. Yeah. Google it on YouTube yeah, and Google get somebody it. else to say it. So it's like all the technical stuff, I, and never mind the swearing is right. Hoping we could find someone who uh, introduced themselves and pronounced their own name so you could. I know, it's, it's the challenges. Anyway, so Lucy, before we leave and get back, leave the book scenario, and we'll get back to sort of, and some of this is covered in the book as well, but I want to sort of 
go back to some of sort of the what you see as the research priorities and so on mm -hmm. moving forward. You're also working, you're working on a second book. Is it a follow-up book? Can you tell us a bit about that and when can we expect it out? It's not a follow-up book. It's coming out in autumn next year. It's about adolescent development and it's about, I still haven't got my spiel down for how to summarise it, but it's about how what happens to you in adolescence affects your adult self. And it's a mixture of the academic research, so a lot of summary, particularly about social behaviour in adolescence, why adolescents pave the way they do. But it was then interweaved with lots of interviews of adults talking about their own teenage experience. And I am so fascinated and so glad that I included that element of it because it's it's transformed my understanding of the subject. And it's just, I think, to really understand how powerful adolescence can be, you know, you need to hear some stories about what happened to people and what they remember from it. And it's not necessarily exceptional events, you know, it's it's events with, you know, romantic relationships and friends and bullying and things. But it's, yeah, I've really found that aspect of it fascinating. I hate writing it. It's far too much effort, but the, the interviews bit has been fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> and so where does your manuscript have to be delivered? By daily August. Of the of of this, August. Of the, yeah. uh, Okay, right. so, yeah, it's quite penguin on quite a long time with it once I've handed it in. But yeah, it's creeping up on me. So that's fascinating, Lucy. Really excited and can't wait to read it. So best luck with getting the, the draft finished by, by August. But maybe can we just circle back to some of the sort of, sort of re specific research type things? Or So maybe if somebody said to you, right, you do all this mental health work. What's the one thing you want people to know about mental health or mental illness or mental health problems? I think I'd really like to promote the idea that a lot of psychological distress is not necessarily, certainly not necessarily a mental illness or disorder and not even necessarily a mental health problem. That, And that doesn't mean we dismiss that person's suffering, but we actually, you don't necessarily need to label it as a as a sort of medical psychiatric phenomenon. Uh, and sometimes actually it's actively unhelpful to do that. So I would love to promote the idea that we, you know, we take it all seriously, but we reserve the idea of it being a mental illness or a mental um, disorder for people that that really applies to, I think. And how do we go about doing that? How do we get yeah. that nuanced message out? Oh, um... <laughs> Well, I suppose doing things like this, doing your book, right? Yes, like exactly. I'm trying to talk about it. Um, but a lot of it is about figuring out how to say it in a respectful mm. way, because some people start, I think there's some overlap with the message I'm trying to promote and what people like Piers Morgan try and promote. And I think people jump on my idea and think, great, you know, I've been telling my teenager it's ridiculous that she says she has an anxiety problem. And I think, well, no, that's not how we move forward with this. I think to better teach people how to take other people's distress seriously, how to listen to them, how to validate it, how to talk about it. The only way this, I mean, the reason why people use the language of mental illness is because they're trying to get heard and they're trying to communicate how distressed they are. So the only way we can sort of dampen down the whole thing is if we start respecting and taking seriously the whole spectrum, essentially. No, I agree. I think that's um, a really important message. And I think that when you mentioned Piers Morgan, I think that sort of approach certainly is counterproductive and it really is not what people like you are trying to say it's that what's more sophisticated message thank so maybe you. related to your message is more sophisticated obviously. yes, yes yeah. thank you yeah i agree um, <laughs> uh, but so moving on then to then research questions so we touched on one of your your sort of lines of research at, at the minute in terms of really trying to understand this what's contributing to the relationship between reporting of mental health and uh mental health awareness and so on. So if we give you a million quid, right? If MQ give you a million quid, what's the one question you wish you would you would try to address for that million quid? So, I mean, there's one thing that I'm doing at the moment, which is trying to, um, but I already have funding for this, is to try and understand um, whether school mental health interventions cause harm. So there's this sort of, I'm sure you're aware of it, but some New studies that have come out showing that some teenagers are worse off having these, especially these kind of whole group 
you know, universal interventions, worse off having them than not having them in terms of um, it leading to an increase in reporting of mental health problems. So that's one thing that I'm very interested in. E you know, even if it's for a minority of teenagers, that can scale up across the country. So we really need to understand whether teaching teenagers about mental health actually leads some of them to report or experience more of these problems. Uh, so that's one strand that I'm really interested in and already doing. But the, this, this, the what I would do if if I had a million pounds of research money would be to start trying to experimentally demonstrate whether the way you talk to people about mental health can actually affect, you know, in the lab, how they report and how they experience certain symptoms. Uh, so then there's tiny pockets of people trying to do this already been shown with physical health symptoms you know depending on the information yeah. that you give people you can you can experimentally induce more or less uh, reporting of these symptoms so I'm very interested in um yeah starting a strand of work that tries to look at that because if you if you can show in a sort of contained lab environment that the way you talk to people um can lead to an increase in how they report their um mental health problems then that's a little piece of evidence to say maybe this is happening on a on a sort of societal scale no, absolutely not. Two fascinating topics and, and related. So go, going back to the um, school mental health interventions, again, it's something I've thought quite a bit about in, in the work that we do as well. And and I suppose the question, and I think it is an unanswered question, you're absolutely right. So, But for me, the, some of the research I've read, which shows where, where there is for some percentage of young people or, or whatever group it is, but mostly this is young people, small proportion you can see maybe an increase in self-reported distress, but in the, say, um, immediately in a pre-post intervention. So the question is, I'm just not quite clear, is do we know anything yet about the longer term impacts about, and or is that what you're trying to do with, with that project you mentioned, Lucy, is looking not just at the immediate manipulative manipulation, if you think of an experimental context, or are you going to look at the medium to longer term impacts? Yeah, same. Most of the time, school mental health interventions just look at pre and post, but there are some that have gone back, you know, six months, 12 months later. Generally, the ones, universal mental health interventions, if they work at all, they generally tend to have quite small effect sizes, which I think shouldn't be surprising in terms of the diversity of who's in the class and the sort of light touch nature of the interventions. Um, but the ones that work, that effect tends to not survive you know, six, 12 months later. So that's important to think about, okay, well, how useful is it to tell people, you know, the idea with school mental health interventions is we just need to teach them the, the, the signs and we just need to give them the skills about what to do when these problems arise. Well, um, you know, if the evidence shows that, I mean, some evidence shows they're not even doing these coping techniques during the intervention than they're supposed to be doing them. So it's very important for the long-term data that shows even the small effects don't survive. Um, but there is also some, I think there's one study I can think of that did show that the, you know, useful effect had been maintained a year later. But there's also a study, a CBT-based intervention that uh, came out from Australia in the last few months uh, that showed the harmful effect at six months, mm -hmm. um, but then wasn't maintained at 12 months. But so, but at six months, the, the teenagers who'd had the CBT-based intervention were showing more internalising symptoms than their you know, matched peers who hadn't had that intervention. Yeah. And so in your study, what's what's the plan with you, and you're going to do in your study then? Are you going to uh, do as a similar follow-up design or? So I'm not running an intervention. So I was quite keen to not kind of wade in and do, you know, and add another intervention to the mix. I want to, so I'm doing some secondary data analysis on studies that already, already exist. So I'm interested in you know if you've got a big enough sample instead of just looking at the average effect across the intervention and then at follow-up whether you can actually look at separate trajectories so you can see um as you might imagine there will be some teenagers who you know start off low um you know start off with uh, poor mental health and then they improve some people who don't change and some people who get worse for example so I'm, I'm interested in trying to understand that getting worse group and whether there's anything consistent that um consistent about them demographically but then I'm also just doing some theoretical work and doing some qualitative work so interviewing teenagers to understand what they actually think about what they're being told at school because I think probably too much of this has happened without doing that step first but also I think the idea is looking at there's an in interventions it's not one size fits all so obviously 
it's not surprising, is it, that if you do an intervention, a blanket intervention, it's going to have differential impact. And uh, I mean, just like in the Myriad study, uh, obviously mindfulness in schools and, and obviously a huge study, and that would be interesting to see what, well, I know there's a number of papers that have been published already about that, but really trying to do a more, in, on an individual level, mm. uh, a N of one, a series of N of ones, mm. to, to see what's going on there. But but again, so so when, what's your timeline, Lucy? When do you hope to do that work or when is it hoping to be? I've got this fellowship for about three and a half more years. So I've got a bit of time, but I'm sure it will pass quickly. But yeah, you, you capture the problem really well, which is that the, the whole point of universal interventions is to teach everyone the same information. But, you know, that might be their, their downfall. Unfortunately, it seems very fair. I mean, it, it has the nice idea that you might be able to capture people who don't who are about to have problems, but who don't yet, are not yet yeah. presenting as such. Yeah, it's fair. You don't have to take people out of lessons to, you know, in a potentially stigmatising way. But, and it's cheap, like it's cheaper than one-to-one -one interventions and group interventions. But it, yeah, I'm I'm not convinced that it's the right approach. Well, we will see. We'll <laughs> keep our eyes and ears peeled and whatever else um, <laughs> for, for the results coming out. So how can we, or how should we be supporting our young people better? Have you any thoughts or reflections on that? in terms of their mental health? I think, unfortunately, a lot of this, it's like the train has left the station and it will be difficult to pull some of this stuff back, even if it was, once we found it might you know, not be helpful, it might actually actively be harmful. I think that in terms of what we can say to young people, well, firstly, yeah, we need to be brave enough to think about actually maybe this approach of trying to teach everyone about mental health might not be the right approach. And that's incredibly difficult to do because it's especially for schools, you know, they they want that, you know, they're seeing these young people who are distressed. They aren't getting the help from CAMS that they need. So they want to do something to help. They want to be seen to be doing something to help. So it, it's very difficult to, to pull back these sort of, mental health lessons, even if they do end up not being uh, the right approach. But on an individual level, I would just, and I've, I, you know, it's, it's anecdotal, but I've had teachers and parents saying, you know, that they've talked about some of these ideas from my book with young people and that has been helpful, this idea that, you know, these things exist on a spectrum and that um, just because you feel anxious, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you or that you have a disorder. And again, it's about sharing that message kindly and respecting whoever you're talking to and you know talk about it in a sort of collaborative way to understand that person's mental health but I I hope that's a, a you know one small useful thing that people can do is to just to talk respectfully respectfully to young people about this idea of things existing on a spectrum and not everything being pathology or everything being just dichotomized as either or what do you think about the theory that a lot of the kind of young people who say that they have these mental health conditions, that it's from a place of being trendy? You know, it's interesting. I've been asked that like three times in the last week and not really before that. So, it's, yeah, you're certainly not the only person who've been, who's been thinking about this. I think it's possible. I think we need to take it seriously as, as a possibility. I think my hunch is perhaps especially with anxiety. You see some really interesting stuff. You can get these like cute pink badges to like that go on school bags that say I have anxiety. So I think that is incredibly important to not, and I'm writing something with Jack Andrews about this at the moment. We We need to think about the social developmental context of adolescence when we think about how we talk about mental health and school interventions. Peer influence is deeply important. You know, mental health problems can be um, contagious within groups. People, teenagers care a lot about what their peers approve of. So it's re we really need to take seriously the possibility that some of these saying you have mental health problems, sometimes for some people might have some social value that then makes them appealing. Yeah, and that, that would be a big problem, you know. And then we need to think about what, what are the messages that they've been fed from the adults in their lives and the campaigns and the teachers and stuff and then how is that spiraling within the individual but between adolescents you know the sort of peer dynamics of that I think is really important mm -hmm. yeah. yeah I mean any explanation of adolescent mental health which doesn't take it take account of the, the social norms or the descriptive mm. norms I mean isn't an isn't a full enough explanation because of course we know especially in adolescents who and I speak of being the parent of two adolescents is <laughs> I mean, how is that? And I and we all remember back to your own adolescence. That how different it is. There's something qualitatively different about that experience of being adolescent. That mismatch between your 
cognitive development and your emotional development and your whatever sensitivity to and, and vulnerability, sensitivity and vulnerability to distress or signals or what your your peers are doing. So just to move it on, so we have a couple of last questions to try and bring it to a, a close, Lucy. So maybe if we can get you to take a step back, right? And you've been doing this work for some time now. Like so in terms of the sort of major trends, I don't mean necessarily in terms of the rates of mental health problems, but but what do you see as sort of the big trends, good and bad, for mental health research or youth mental health research over the last decade or so? Well, I think, yeah, if we go, if we think it, as far back as a decade, it's really interesting. We've essentially seen the the popularization of mental health interventions in schools and then possibly this, the beginnings of a backlash against them. A backlash is too strong a word, but beginnings of scepticism and recognition, recognition that they sometimes don't work and they sometimes actually cause harm. And that's really only a conversation that's been started in the last year or so, actually, I say, but I would say, but 10 years ago, you know, I worked on Myriad um, as a postdoc starting in 2015. And that was really the, it was all quite novel then the idea that possibly we should, we could go in and, and teach teenagers uh, mental health interventions in schools. Um, and if that if that could move the dial, then that would be brilliant. So I think, yeah, in the last 10 years, we've seen the sort of arrival of that. And then this, the, yeah, some some disappointing results and, and some reckoning in the field about what we need to do next. Good. And then so then in terms of your hopes moving forward, you've already mentioned your, you, what you do with your million pound. Anything else that you think we should be we should be really focusing on moving forward? Apart from like the, because I think you've made really valuable the points that I like the one about once well effectively the one size fits all the why do we expect these interventions on a group basis to be work for everybody any other things any other key hopes for the future in terms of mental health research i mean it's a boring one but obviously i, I would love if people who needed help from the nhs could get it i suppose that's not a research thing is it it's just a money thing that you know the sad thing is that we do have treatments that can work but the people who need them um, can't access them but yeah, in terms of what's happening in schools and what's happening in young people, a lot of what I've said with that we don't have a good enough understanding about the way young people are interpreting and understanding the messages they're being received, and then particularly how they're sort of interacting with each other about these messages. Um, we also need to, I think it makes sense for schools to be a place where we provide some sort of mental health intervention for people who need it. But if, if it's not universal interventions, then you need to figure out how you get it to targeted groups or individuals without stigmatizing them. And again, coming back to the, you know, the peer context of adolescence, that's not irrelevant. You have to be very careful about even if you had an effective group intervention for, you know, teenagers at risk of depression, you have to somehow take them out of their class or, you know, somehow separate them from their peers. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's done in an obvious way or in a way that's embarrassing or something, then they you know, it could be the difference between whether they turn up or not. So I, I, I think we've got quite a long way to go in terms of understanding what schools can do most usefully to help. Well, actually, just on that, in Scotland, we have this programme called the Distress Brief Intervention Programme, which we've been heavily involved in. We started off with adults. Since anybody who presents in distress, to the emergency department, to the police, to general practice, and they're offered up to 14 days of support by a, a, mental, a trained mental health professional, and what we've just moving it into schools, we've just started moving it into schools. It's targeted. Um, so we're now, we started initially in 16 and 17 year olds, and then we've moved it down to four, 14 upwards. And and again, we're still, we have to, it hasn't been evaluated yet, but the, certainly the interim feedback is positive. And the young people in distress who, because you get immediate, there's no waiting list, right? So it's a, within 24 hours, if you, if, you uh, if, if, if one of your guidance teachers, if you come to your guidance teacher and say, I'm in distress, one of the possible referral pathways will be this. Now, time will tell how, in terms of its, its, of its efficacy, but thus far, the data we have thus far from the pilot work has been really, really encouraging. That's something we're now trying to move it into other schools in different contexts so we can have large enough numbers to make some sense of it. But again, it's trying to do what you just suggested, Lucy, of something which is targeted. Mm -hmm. Targeted, tailored, and not stigmatizing. And the stigmatizing stuff hasn't really doesn't seem to be an issue thus far. Um, and that, um, yeah, because it's 
because we it's framed the whole aim of it it's a non-medical intervention it's, or it's non that we describe as non-clinical sorry non-clinical intervention because it's helping people with problem solving and a range of other things so it's, so be interesting to see how that progresses but just in my head when you said that it sounds exciting and because often adults as well but teenagers who are distressed just want someone they can talk to and someone that will listen to them respectfully and allow them to you know talk through and explore the problem and the sad thing is with all the waiting lists is that they don't get access to that and often because of this very sort of medicalized approach to mental health now schools teachers are worried about intervening themselves or talking to that young person themselves they think this is a mental health problem so I'd better refer it on which is, you know, the climate of fear is understandable, but it means that then that young person is not getting, you know, a supportive conversation with the trusted adult, which might actually just be exactly what they need. So, yeah, that sounds exciting. And I I, I hope it has some promising results and that it might come to England as well. <laughs> well, on that note, Lucy, a couple of final quick questions as our time is almost up. Yes. So we're trying to ask all of our guests a couple of sort of non-necessarily mental health questions towards the end so the first one is and, and it's really apt on this podcast because we've spoken a lot about teenagers or uh, adolescents uh, reflecting on you're no longer 16 so but what advice would you give your 16 year old self <laughs> I really don't know and it's funny because I'm writing a book about adolescents asking people to think back about their adolescents so I have inevitably inevitably thought back a lot about my own it would probably just be something about worrying less, you know, a classical example of someone being unnecessarily anxious and things never coming to bear, almost never coming to bear. So I'd probably encourage myself to worry a bit less. <laughs> yeah, I think that's sound, sound advice indeed. And then one last one, which is thinking about one or two people, living or dead, who you would, haven't had a, an opportunity to have a coffee or a dinner with. Who would that, I know it's a wee bit unfair do spring that one on you, but hey, who comes to mind or does anybody come to mind top of your list? It would probably be people who like writing because I could talk about writing all day. Um, all people who are interested in this stuff that we've been talking about. So I, I don't know if you know Nick Haslam's work. Um, he's doing really interesting theoretical work about the shifting cultural ideas about what we call mental health and what we call trauma. And um, after about three years of admiring his work, I emailed him the other day and just said, I don't know why it's taken me so long to write this, but, um, you know, I really enjoy your work. And we had a chat and obviously that was over Teams or Zoom or whatever. So, you know, people like that who are interested in thinking about mental health in a clever way and not... Yeah, and he, you say them, he's in the book, isn't he? I think it's yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like his, yeah. His, his work was really, um, really informative for shaping my thinking and... Just for saying, you know, it's okay to be, we can say these things and we can start questioning the status quo. So anyone like that and anyone who's fun as well, if it's going to be dinner, then it's got to be people who are fun as well. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, it just remains on behalf of Craig and I, Lucy, thanks so much. Best of luck for writing the second book. Genuinely looking forward to seeing what, how it turns out because your first book was, was brilliant and that real scale of balance in that personal narrative with science and applicability and common humanity so so really I'm really excited about that and and also looking forward of course to see the the fruits of of your empirical and, and theoretical research so thank you so much and have thank a great you so day. much for having me thank you thanks